Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you very much for the time that you have spent in this case for a journey that we told you back before we took the view was going to be a journey that you wouldn't forget. It has been a long couple of weeks. You have been incredibly attentive, and we are very, very appreciative of that. One of the things you heard just a moment ago from Attorney Smith was that you did the opportunity to come back up here and talk again. That's true. It's all taking turns. It's something the parents teach children. In the beginning, state has to go first, defendant has to go second. At the closings, defendant has to go first, state has to go second. Something very simple that parents teach children. One of the other things that they should teach is if you're going to quote the defendant, if you're going to quote a witness, you have to make sure that you're accurate. So I'll apologize in advance. But let's quote people accurately. I fucked up. Again and again and again. I fucked up. I fucked up. That's what the defendant, his language, that he used when he told Travis Beach at the night he got the U-Haul, the night that he disappeared Harmony's body, to whatever place it is now, where he knows it is right now, to this day, his words, I fucked up. Not she, not we, not Kayla, I, I fucked up. Singular, personal, solo. That's the defendant's words. Defense counsel got up here in openings and said that you'd hear evidence that Adam Montgomery was out in the middle of the night doing his business when something happened and Harmony died. If that were so, the defendant never would have told Travis Beach, I fucked up. Adam Montgomery was no loving, caring parent, but an enraged tyrant who had no business being around young Harmony. So together, let's look at the actual evidence, the actual quotes of what you saw and heard as we look at all of the charges that you're going to deliberate on that encapsulate what the defendant did do and talk about the evidence that you've seen tells you what he committed. And let's start first with what the defendant's telling you in opening arguments and now that you can and should find him guilty of abuse of a corpse and falsifying physical evidence. Let's set that as the baseline. Let's start there. Let's see what that actually means before we look at how he committed every of, each one of the crimes charged, not just the ones that he feels are going to distract you from the rest of the nightmare that he's responsible for. Who carried Harmony's body away from the broken down car in the duffel bag, hit her outside a colonial village while they stayed in Anthony Badero's blue Audi for two nights, put Harmony under a ramp and then in a van and then in this cooler for weeks at Christina Lupin's house. Into the CMC bag, into the walk-in cooler at Portland Pie Company, in the fridge, in the freezer, defrosted her in the shower, consolidated her body yet again, brought her to the Econo Lodge, tricked his friend into renting him the U-Haul, and then dumped her body somewhere. All to make sure that the evidence that could have been brought before you that shows that he's responsible for having murdered her would never be found. And he says you can and should find him guilty of those two crimes, of abuse of a corpse and falsifying physical evidence for this. He doesn't dispute this. The defense said all of that in their openings, that the defendant did both of these two bolded things. Since day two of this trial, opening arguments, you should then consider not only all of the testimony, but also all of the corroborating testimony about all of those charges. So those two, falsifying physical and abuse of the corpse, to be true. So let's make it very, very painfully clear from the indictments that you're going to be considering, the falsifying physical evidence and abuse of the corpse, making this harmony fit into this and disappearing her body in the condition that it could not be found for a trial like this one. The evidence was there and the defendant's counsel professed to you that he's not disputing that, not saying he didn't commit these crimes. So you can check these two off the list. And with that, you gotta remember the defendant gets no credit for this. He says that you can and should find him guilty of these, but he's not taking responsibility for him. He hasn't admitted anything. He's not taking responsibility for anything that he did. His argument to you is not because he's taking responsibility. It's tactical. He admits what he can't deny. And he denies what he can't afford to admit. He cannot deny each and every single one of these facts that were presented to you. That she died on the seventh. That he brought her in a double bag to Colonial Village. Stored her under a deck, into a red cooler, in the closet of fit, in the ceiling built. It's her blood in the ceiling at the fit shelter at 177 Lake Ave. And his fingerprints in the ceiling, remember? Left hand prints in the ceiling. The only other person being formed Mr. Mondrag, the drywall installer. Into the CMC bag to Portland Pie Company. Over to Union Street, consolidating her body even more, bringing her to the Econolodge, tricking Travis Beach, and dumping her body so it wouldn't be found. The argument that the defendant is making, he had to make. His concessions don't mean he's taken responsibility for these crimes. It doesn't mean that he's a man of principle or restraint, nor does it give his argument any credibility that because I concede all this, well, the rest of it must not be true. The whole thing's true. And he's taken responsibility for none of this. So again, baseline, first things first, before we move on, these two charges and the charges that his counsel argued can and should find him guilty of, they're there. That's done. And that's the tip of the iceberg. It's all of the charges. Every single one of them has been proven by evidence, not emotion beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is the man who did all of these things. And that's because you saw the evidence. You went on the view. You saw witnesses take this stand and put themselves before you. And you'll look them in the eye. And the same common sense that you use every day to tell whether somebody is feeding you a lion, a bull, or not, you use with those witnesses. And because of that, you know that this is true. Because you heard from people. Like Kevin Montgomery, Nick Hearn, Katie Moore, all talking about the defendant telling them in July about the worst thing he had ever done up until that point. You heard from Kayla, two days from Kayla, and all of the other witnesses that corroborate her, how he beat Harmony. This 35-pound child, remember nurse drivers told you that she was measured just back in June before the July incident occurred. 35 pounds, five years old, 35 pounds. And you heard from all those witnesses, especially Caleb, about why he beat Harmony to death, when he beat Harmony, and how he beat Harmony, and you vetted what she had to say. And you saw the rest of the injuries that he incurred, that he incurred and all of that was corroborated by the other evidence presented. Corroborated in ways that we'll explore that the witness never could have possibly known there was other evidence out there that supported them. Not when the defendant started telling investigators what happened and how the defendant beat the life out of Harmony. And then beat and manipulated and controlled Kayla afterwards to make sure that she stuck to the story. 
so he would not be held accountable and the evidence of his crimes would not be found. So when he says that you can find him guilty of these, understand that these two are but a part of the whole of his criminality, of how he murdered Harmony as well. When he said this to Travis Beach, it wasn't for part of that. It was for the whole of taking Harmony's life and beyond. Don't forget what he's saying that you ought to convict him on as well. That the falsifying physical evidence and that the abuse of the corpse are on themsel unto themselves evidence of the crime of murder. He's a murderer. That's getting rid of evidence. That's what murderers do. They get rid of evidence that would show others what they've done. They think no body, no evidence, no conviction. They silence witnesses into saying silent or even perjuring themselves so that the witnesses don't tell others what the murderer did. Because murderers don't want to be held accountable for their actions. Murderers want to get rid of the evidence. They don't mind abusing the body so that the evidence of how their victim was murdered can never be found or used against them. They clean bathrooms with ammonia after they get rid of the evidence, like this defendant did. They clean out the plumbing lines, like this defendant wanted to do. They desecrate and hide the dead so that the body cannot tell the story of how they died to the living. That's what murderers do. That's what the defendant did. Because he's a murderer too. Now, let's really start now. Let's start and talk about what he did first to Harmony. Excuse me. Let's talk about what happened in June. Let's talk about the second degree assault. You will likely never forget Kevin Montgomery's testimony as he was sitting up here taking the time to thoroughly make sure he answered truthfully and recalled to the best of his recollection. And you are never gonna forget how he described Harmony's face when he flew home from Florida, having been there in July, come back on the 22nd to see Harmony in the house in the kitchen. And we saw him relive that moment for us, admitting that he asked her, quote, oh my God, Harmony, or oh my fucking God, Harmony, what did you do to your face, end quote. And how he told us, Adam answered the question. Not Harmony, Adam did. She didn't do anything. I bashed her around the fucking house. That's not disciplining a child. That's not pulling her away or jerking her and not protecting someone else. If it had been, the defendant never would have said this when Kevin asked Harmony what happened. Wait, Kevin Montgomery told you he was subpoenaed to be here. He did not want to testify against his nephew. And you saw it on his face that he remembered what the defendant said he did. Not Harmony answering the question. The defendant answered it for her. And remember how Kevin said the defendant said this. Another moment, probably not going to forget. When I asked Kevin about how the defendant said he bashed her around the house, Kevin, you'll recall, said, quote, like a cocky son of a bitch. Nick Ahern told us he saw that black eye and how bad it was. And what did the defendant do? Lied to him. Nick told us how the defendant told him that it was from an injury from playing soccer. Nick told you he only saw it for what? How many seconds? Four seconds. Only saw it for four seconds. Saw how bad it was. He described it as being pretty intense, that it was concerning to him. And that the defendant let her be outside for all of four seconds before the defendant told her to get back inside. And what did Harmony do? She obeyed. Nick saw him walk Harmony right back through the front door and then shut it. And so why did Nick hide Harmony away that day? Because he couldn't let a five-year-old outside on a summer day, could he? Not when her face showed the mark of the assault that he had delivered on her. Shows everyone in the neighborhood along with Nick evidence of what the defendant did to her. Katie Morin told us that the defendant used other words to describe that day and what he did, besides bashing her around the house. Did she say jerk? Did she say grab? Did she say yank? She did not. The defendant told her it was, quote, the worst thing I'd ever done, end quote. And that he had supposedly backhanded her. That tells you that the defendant knew how badly he beat Harmony that day in July. That the defendant called it to Katie Morin the worst thing that he had ever done. And the evidence from the multiple people who saw how bad this was and who heard the defendant describe either inflicting it upon her or hiding her. Don't forget, we also have Demetrius Sarves. When he first went to the house, was he able to see Harmony? He told you. Only from feet away, as the defendant was hurrying up and getting Harmony in the car and driving her out of there. And even a week later, when he finally does get to see Harmony, she still has a mark on her face. Finally, you've also got Kayla Montgomery, who told you she overheard the defendant's conversation with Kevin Montgomery and then confronted him because he told her it was from a lightsaber that one of the boys had been swinging around and Harmony got hit in the face. And she confronted him about it and said, you said it was from a lightsaber. He said, yeah, no. What I said to Kevin was correct. He admits that he lied to her before when he told Harmony, I'm sorry, when he told Kayla that Harmony got hit by a lightsaber. More evidence that corroborates that what Kevin said happened. His conversation with Adam, where Adam admitted to hitting Harmony in July, did happen. Simply put, from multiple witnesses, from the defendant's multiple confessions, he committed the crime of second degree assault on a five-year-old in July of 2019. And of that, there is simply no doubt. That being said, now, now we can move on. Who and where and why Harmony was killed? Let's go through what the evidence showed us one thing at a time. We saw that it was not alone with Kayla, not in the Colonial Village parking lot in the middle of the night where Adam had gone to go do his business, not that it was something that you heard that it happened. It was the defendant in the car on the morning of the 7th with his fists. And it was cold. We know it was cold. So cold that Badero's car died that night when they moved over into the Audi. 
Adam wrote to Matt Gendron, remember that they were freezing, cold enough so that Kim Frayne went and gave them the battery pack to help give them the jump start. So we know it must have been cold enough that day that blankets in the back of a car did not appear out of place. Kayla told us how the accidents were happening, and yes, something had happened the night before, but she told you the night before was when the defendant first hit her. For an, why? For another accident that Harmony had had in the car. An accident that Kayla did nothing about. An accident that the defendant did nothing about and told Kayla to let Harmony lie in it. Kayla told you what it smelled like and she told you to your face that she still did nothing about it. And in the morning, things were still the same. Kayla described for you how it started up again. It was still dark outside. She told you the first blow in the morning, it was still dark outside. We know that. Why? Because it's December 7th. Because it's before they get to the methadone clinic, and we know that the check-in times there are 7.05 and 7.09. And you know how dark it is in December, just a couple of days away from the darkest day of the year, December 22nd. So when the defendant gets out of the car, goes in and gets his methadone, and then comes back, he finds Harmony has done it again. The smell of her inability to control her bladder and her bowels, something that she used to be able to do just fine for years. It's back again in his car again. The last place that he has, the only place that he has. And what does the man whom Kayla saw be so rageful do. And remember, that rageful wasn't just seen by Kayla, wasn't it? We heard from Rose Smith, the driver, years later, 2021. She told you that after giving Kayla a ride to the methadone clinic with Adam and coming back, that Kayla had had bruises that day, terrible black eyes, and that she tried to give her phone to Kayla. And her words were that when he wrenched that phone out of her hands, he told her, you are not giving that phone to my wife. And she described his face how? A look of pure rage. What does that person do when they get back to the car after their methadone and Harmony has soiled herself again? All he has is his car and his rage and his fists. And Kayla described for you how that went on. For the length of time that the same length of time that you took driving from the clinic here on Market Street up to the Burger King on Hooksit Road, you drove that drive. You know how long that is. And as the smell continued, she described that the hitting continued. And Harmony took blow after blow until she was moaning. And the defendant points to the fact and says, well, other people, they should have been able to see in the car. It's cold. It's dark. We know there's snow on the ground. Snow in New Hampshire means salt, which means the windows probably look the exact same that yours and mine did this morning. It's not easy visibility. Plus, think about it. <coughs> It doesn't take a lot to be able to punch a 5 pound child and make sure that it's below the window seat. Not for him. Not for Adam Montgomery. Not against Harmony. Not in that car. And you saw from the Walmart video and the video from Officer Stanzel when they first approached the defendant when he was trying to find where Harmony was, you saw from that how the defendant looked. Remember him at Walmart. He's not a small or a weak man. He wouldn't need to use much power to inflict deadly force upon Harmony's skull. And you heard it wasn't from one blow of his arm, but several. Take a moment. Let's talk, just take a break and talk about something that defense brought up, the fact that there are other, child, other children in the car and why wouldn't they have been screaming and yelling. I remember that um, 
a fun catchphrase she tried to get Kayla to say, a cascade of chaos would have ensued. We know young children adapt to their environment like nobody's business. They're frightened by new faces. They're frightened by new experiences or the unexpected, but they're not frightened by something that's familiar. Why would the other children cry if Harmony had been getting hit and punished in the car? After all, this was the second time in less than 12 hours that they would have seen this if they were awake. They would not have been unfamiliar with his rage towards Harmony in that car. The defendant's theory that punishing Harmony for soiling herself would make the other children cry implies that this is unfamiliar to them. And the evidence shows that it is not. Kayla rejected that cascade of chaos every single time it was proposed to her. And both Kayla and common sense tell you that that makes sense, that that's true. Now, when they got to Burger King, the damage at that point had already been done. As Kayla told you, Harmony laid under the blanket. No one went to get help for her. Not the defendant who beat her, not for Kayla either. And what did the defendant say in that moment? Words matter. I think I heard her this time. This time. This time. I think I heard her. I think I did something. Why say this? Because he didn't do nothing. He did something. He took her life in rage over a bathroom accident. And he admitted in his opening that you can and should find him guilty of abusing her corpse and falsifying physical evidence for what he did afterwards to get rid of the evidence get rid of her, get rid of the evidence that would have shown he murdered her. But it was the evidence of his crime of beating her. I fucked up. I think I did something. I think I hurt her this time. That's what he believed. <coughs> you saw Kayla testify. You heard for two full days, practically, while she was on the stand, having to tell you what she saw having happened. And Kayla did nothing. She did nothing. She did not parent Harmony. She did not clean Harmony. She did not change Harmony when she soiled herself and the defendant told her to leave her in it. She didn't stop the defendant she didn't try to get Harmony help. She didn't call 911. She didn't yell out. She didn't run out of the car. She didn't disobey the defendant. She's not seeking help. She's not seeking attention. He went through the trunk to get her, not her, because she did nothing. Later, she didn't betray him until after she even lied in grand jury and committed perjury for him. She didn't lift a finger. She did nothing. Nothing at all. The defendant wants to have their cake and eat it too when they come to describe her. She's an abuser, but she did something in the middle of the night. She didn't see anything here, but she saw it all. She wants the defendant. Oh, she doesn't want the defendant. Believe her grand jury testimony, but don't believe her grand jury testimony, the part where she said she lied. That part you should actually believe, even though she's telling you it's a lie. Want to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to her testimony. Well, you know, she would have been really conscientious when she was shopping for diapers. Because that's, if you're homeless, yeah, that would make sense. You want to go where you can get the cheapest price. She's a drug user, she's homeless. And for Harmony, she does nothing. They want to argue, well, she would have had this instinct to protect that child. Oh, but she did something to her in the middle of the night. She did nothing. We are tested, all of us, just a few moments in our lives to do the right thing, where our character as human beings is tested to do the right thing. And on this test, December 7th, with where Kayla Montgomery was back in that life, she failed. 
at grand jury, she failed. She still obeyed him. Even though he had run off to Maine with a second girlfriend since then, she still obeyed him. Katie Morin told you that back then, Kayla would have done anything for the defendant. That's what her protector did to her. He had her conditioned so well, physically and mentally, that she kept his secret, and she did nothing. You saw that in her testimony when she told you about doing nothing. And she told you about not stopping him from hitting Harmony. And she admitted, unashamedly, without reservation, she didn't try to take Harmony to the bathrooms to clean her up. She didn't try to get her help. She did obey. She took Harmony's body to Portland Pie when he told her to later. Sitting her between her two children in the stroller for that 15 minute walk down the street. But she did nothing. You don't have to like her to believe her. You don't have to like what she did. You may have very good reasons for hating her. But that doesn't change the fact that she saw the defendant beat Harmony to death. That doesn't change her credibility on telling us what the defendant did. Just because you believe that her failure to do the right thing is despicable, that doesn't mean that on this she's not credible. She actually tried to humanize this guy. Remember her testimony? She cried. And she said to you and admitted that she still cares about him. Her in prison. Harmony somewhere. Only he knows. And she still cares about him. And she admits how she did nothing for Harmony. If she was singing for her supper, like the defendant suggested in their opening, she wouldn't have done that, would she? She'd have an answer for every question, an excuse for every moment that she did nothing. She didn't have that on the stand. She would never have admitted that she didn't take the kids to the bathroom or that she let Harmony sit in it that night. And yet she did that someone who's not making up a story to make herself look better, is it? She never would have admitted that when Harmony is covered by the blanket as they get their food from Burger King, that she unceremoniously dumped a breakfast sandwich on top of the blanket. Harmony can open that herself. After the defendant had covered her and smashed her face. And yet, that is what she told you happened. Kayla admitted to you that she did nothing. It's not the face of a person who's trying to make themselves out to be the saint and the defendant to be the devil. That's certainly not a master criminal schemer trying to exonerate her own behavior as you just heard in closing arguments. She is not like the defendant. She's not admitting that she, what she can't deny and denying what she can't afford to admit because if she did, she would have never admitted to her failure to act to protect Harmony. She would have never denied doing the small things. She would have claimed, oh, I did do those. I tried to redeem myself. And how she comes across, and how she testifies. What she is, is a battered woman admitting an inconvenient and terrible truth that she failed in a moment of life when her character was put to the test. She did nothing to help Harmony, nothing to stop her, she didn't kill her. Only the defendant did that. So when defense counsel says that it was Kayla who put Harmony in a duffel bag in the trunk and told Adam about it later, you heard and saw Kayla testify, she did nothing for Harmony. Not a thing. And you can't get something from nothing. And the defendant's promise at opened, openings that you'd see she did something remains exactly now as it was then and it's a false promise you've seen that theory with evidence presented to test it and it is still without support it is still without corroboration and it is still unreasonable to believe because it was the defendant who did something when you consider Kayla's testimony 
don't consider it alone. Consider it with all of the facts that go along with that testimony. Facts such as that she does have an agreement, an agreement to tell the truth. Defense counsel questioned her and argued that, well, she had to give the police a lot more to get out of the additional lies that she said in grand jury. But remember, if she doesn't tell the truth, all of this comes back on her. It's back to square one for her. Her agreement is null and void. But the evidence that you saw, how thoroughly the police investigated this case, where Harmony is, location after location after location in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, 900 plus pieces of evidence to help find out what happened has only corroborated Kayla about who killed Harmony, about when she died, who hit her, who mangled her body, and who dumped her where she is now, somewhere between here and the Tobin Bridge in Massachusetts. Corroboration, big, fancy, five-syllable word that stands for evidence that supports that a statement is true. If you just had Kayla's testimony alone, with her truthful testimony on the elements of the crime charged, that would be enough for you to go ahead and find the defendant guilty of all the charges. But you don't just have her testimony. You have so much more because every witness, 50 witnesses that came in and testified to you about and provided evidence, I provide some corroboration for Kayla's account of what happened in ways that she never could have known. And that includes testimony and evidence that corroborates her, to her on how Kayla died, and, I'm sorry, how Harmony died, and why the defendant killed Harmony. Why her body was desecrated. How Kayla was silenced for so long. And how the defendant discarded Harmony like trash so she wouldn't be found. Let's look at just one example. How do we know that Kayla's telling the truth when she told us how the defendant tried to induce or cause her to stick to his story, to not testify, to not tell people how he murdered and disposed of Harmony. How do we know that Kayla's telling the truth on that, tampering with her as a witness? It's because the evidence corroborates it. Nicole Giles told us that Kayla was still at the fit on Lake Avenue, the Families in Transition Shelter, when she saw bruises on Kayla's body. This is back in January of 2020, before Harmony was ever known to be missing. And Kayla is admitting to Miss Giles that the defendant is beating her. And she what? She asked Miss Giles not to tell anyone. Having just been homeless, now living in a transition shelter with two younger children, and having been tested before and failed to get help for a child, she stays silent. She obeys and sticks with the defendant's story. Despite her abuse later, we see that as well from the testimony of Roseanne Smith. Rose Smith, who was giving her that ride for methadone that morning, saw the beating that Kayla had taken the night before. And as she again saw pure rage in the defendant's face as he came and wrenched the phone out of Rose's hands, saying, you're not going to give my wife that phone. So much so that when you heard and saw Rose testify, you heard her say, Ever since then, she refused to drive them around anymore. That she carries pepper spray now. And she said, quote, something I will never forget. Kayla is under control and doesn't say what happens to Harmony throughout that time period. And he believes that she's helping police. You heard testimony about how he believed the police were listening in on him and tracking him, and that he was ripping light fixtures down, that he was breaking thermostats and electronics. Kayla told you that he was paranoid that she was working with police and was being listened to. It's not a sign of mental illness. That's not a sign of being sad. A sign of guilty conscience. A sign that you want to continue to exert control, and you should think of it as such. That's corroborated by Dennis Cloutier. Remember the handyman at 644 Union Street. He saw the ripped down electronics, the broken thermostats, and he made the repairs. We also see more of that witness tampering from the testimony of Tara Hilbert. Next door on Orange Street, when Kayla finally does escape physically the clutches of the defendant. 
to the cycle of abuse that he had perpetrated for so long, the defendant didn't want to be found out. And since Kayla, the, excuse me, he silenced Kayla because he didn't want to be found out what he had done. And you know that from the very beginning. Don't forget the Facebook messages to Travis Beach. The U-Haul was still out there. What did he tell Travis? The day after, the next morning, when he's trying to find out, Travis is trying to find out where the van, because it's supposed to be back, what does he tell Travis right then? Please don't message me stuff like this on Facebook again. Just like getting rid of the body and destroying physical evidence, convincing witnesses to what you've done to stay silent, that's what murderers do. That's what this defendant did. They silenced them into staying silent. And the defendant did that for so very long, he made sure that it was his story that was being told. He continued to tell his story and different variations of it to everybody, his lie that he created. To Christina Lubin, remember, this would have been the first day after they got booted out of Anthony Badero's Audi at Christina's place, tells her, I dropped her off in Massachusetts with her mother. Jessica Guerin tells her over a year later, in, while she's de delivering a, a gift for her boyfriend, tells her at that time, oh, my other daughter, yeah, uh, she's down in Massachusetts, and quickly changes the subject. Demetrios Saros, the former DCYF employee, tells her, no, nope, sent her down to her mother in Massachusetts, did that right around Thanksgiving. Courtney Garcia, who sees Harmony in the car on Thanksgiving Day and not there just a couple of weeks later, what's the defendant's story? What does the defendant, not Kayla, what does the defendant tell all of these people and tell Courtney Garcia? Dropped her off at my mother's. She was having bathroom problems. No, I'm sorry, dropped her off at her mother's. She was having bathroom problems. Tells Rebecca Maines, dropped her off with her biological mother. Biological mother doesn't even let me see her. A clever lie that works if Kayla sticks to the story that he's told everyone. And it did for a long time. It's why Kayla's in prison today. And corroborating evidence comes not only from the witnesses, but again, from evidence of receipts and from photographs. Because a picture does speak a thousand words. That is not the face of the person who's in control. It's the face of the person who was kept under control. She needed to be kept under control so that what the defendant did to his daughter would not be found out. And it worked for a long time. But all the witnesses who corroborate all, the te all testified to a different aspect of seeing the control that he exerted on Kayla and the stories that he told others to stop her from actually working for the police and to stop her from telling police what really happened. That's about what he does to her. But what else corroborates Kayla about why Harmony was killed? The defendant again, not only about why, but telling Courtney Garcia and Rebecca Maines that why she is no longer with him, or one of the reasons at the time he gets rid of her, is because she's having bathroom accidents. So you know that that's the reason why he did what he did to her on the morning of December 7th. He's still mad about why this happened. He's still talking about it. Months with Rebecca Maines, years later, it's why he killed her, having accidents in the car. When Kayla said that the defendant hit her overnight and says words of, you have to stop doing this, that's corroborated by what he told Courtney Garcia and Rebecca Maines, that he got rid of Harmony because she was having accidents. Rebecca Maines told us just yesterday, a friend of his, a close friend of his, that these accidents are what made him take Harmony away. To what did Rebecca testify? The defendant told her a better place for Harmony. A better place. He told her that he thought Harmony was having these accidents on purpose. And Courtney Garcia especially recalled that the defendant said the accidents were happening while they were living in the car. So when the defendant says there's no evidence to support Kayla about what happened in the car, you know that's not true. 
Rebecca Maines could not have been clearer yesterday when she told you and clarified for both sets of counsel that the defendant told her he hated Harmony because Harmony reminded him of Harmony's mother. She could not have been clearer about that. Remember, if the defendant himself agrees with his displeasure and anger at Harmony when he got rid of her, and it, that it was because of having accidents in the car, and when he says it to other people, that's not a coincidence. That's corroboration. Corroboration that he was angry at Harmony for the bathroom accidents. E evidence that even though this little five-year-old girl that he thought was doing it on purpose, evidence of why he was so angry that morning. What else corroborates Kayla's account of when Harmony was killed and what the defendant did to her? Matt Gendron and Kim Frayne, both of them corroborate the time of when this occurred. Both of them corroborated because hey, Kayla told you it happened when they were back, excuse me, when, the last night that they had their car going into the morning the drive from the methadone clinic to Burger King in the morning on December 7th. And after that, they move into Anthony Badero's Audi. And what do we have on that cold, dark winter night, December 8th, 2019, just after midnight, we've got the defendant Facebook messaging away to Matt Gendron as he told him, hey, need help, ASAP, please. Need a jump and jumper cables, ASAP. I need a jump. My car died. We've been sleeping in our car and the battery, I'm sorry, we've been sleeping in our car and the battery just died. My car died. My car, me. And we know what car he's staying in. It's Anthony Badero's blue Audi. We know that from the tow receipt because the car went and got towed by Aaron Sweeney earlier on on the 7th. Matt didn't want to go out. Kim agreed to go out, got there with the jumper pack and when she was there, no harmony. The two boys get in the car. Harmony doesn't get in the car. More corroboration of when this happened. Separate from Kayla's testimony, separate from the corroboration that what she says is in fact the truth. What is unreasonable to be believed? What is not corroborated? It's not corroborated is the defendant's theory that something happened in the middle of the night while he wasn't there. There has been no evidence of that. I'm going to talk about Mr. Badero for a few more minutes. The defendant proclaimed in opening that the defendant wasn't around, excuse me, that he wasn't around that night because he was doing his business to get them out of that car. He's unemployed. He got no business. What business? have we seen or heard any testimony about. He wasn't out working for Anthony Badero, making money and doing his business because Anthony Badero showed us he's not the type of guy who's gonna go ahead and hire the defendant to go out and work for him in the middle of the night. Tony Badero is not the type of guy who lets a homeless family stay in his car for more than two days. He was the type of guy who wanted that the family wanted to make sure didn't find out that they were living in Tony Badero's parking lot before their car broke down. And Tony Badero was definitely not the type of guy who was going to trust a homeless drug user who buys drugs from him to drive his car around at the middle of the night to help deliver drugs. Mr. Badero testified that he drove his car back then despite not having a license. It's not reasonable for you to believe that he is going to have Adam Montgomery drive him around that night either to deliver drugs or for in exchange for drugs. <laughs> I mean, I remember, Mr. Badero admitted to you that when he met the defendant, it was in the late summer of 2019. When? The one time that he, one time he told you that he had the defendant drive him. And what was he driving to? The courthouse on charges for Mr. Badero getting caught for driving without a license. When you go to the courthouse for charges of driving without a license, probably a good idea if you don't drive your own car. Probably a good idea to have somebody else drive you, which is what Mr. Badero testified to, that that was the one time he had the defendant drive his car. And that's back in the summer. 
long before the family's homeless, long before December of 2019. If the defendant gets pulled over making drug deliveries in the middle of the night, as defense is suggesting you, Mr. badero has got a lot bigger problems to worry about than driving around without a license. Employing the defendant as his driver is something that Mr. Badero denied, and as you can see from reason, is not something that Mr. Badero would have done. It's not rational. It's also not rational to believe that Mr. Badero would have entrusted the defendant to go out and deliver his drugs for him. From all of the testimony you've heard at that time, you can easily imagine that if Mr. Badero trusted the defendant to go deliver drugs for him, the drugs that got delivered were probably going to be a lot less than what Mr. Demero, De Badero had promised his customers. Common sense tells you that is not true. Common sense tells you that the defendant has no place to be the night of the 6th and the 7th, except in his car, with his family, with Harmony. He has no business. He has nowhere else to be. And why did Mr. Badero tell us all this? He also said that he, the defendant and Kayla, when he saw them, were always together. Always together. And that when he did go outside and see the kids, it was during the course of the relationship. Mr. Badero said, when those days, on the out days when they were in the Audi and he went outside, he did not see Harmony. Harmony was not there on the 8th. Harmony was not there on the 9th. And Kayla, as much as got jumbled a few minutes ago in closing arguments, Kayla was clear as well. It's one of the lies that she told you was a lie that the defendant doesn't want you to believe is a lie. She told you in grand jury that she lied and said that, oh, in grand jury, I told Anthony Badero, I, I, I know that Anthony Badero saw the kids in Harmony and waved to him every day. I said that in grand jury, and I lied in grand jury. But you just heard in closing arguments that the defendant doesn't want you to believe that that's a lie, even though she admitted that that's a lie. You want to have your cake, and you want to eat it too. That's what the defendant wants. What else is unreasonable to believe? Arguments that, well, no one would have seen him stuffing her, in, stuffing her into the duffel bag when the car was pulled over on the intersection of Webster and Elm. Nobody, nobody, that could have happened, and for nobody to have seen it, that's impossible. It's easy to manipulate 35 pounds in a rear seat of a passenger when your back is to the sidewalk and the shrubs that you saw there on that section of the road with a building with very few windows on that section of the road, when it's freezing cold and everyone around you is distracted by the woman who's waving other cars to go around. The physical evidence in the car and the physicality of manipulating Harmony's body show that this is yet another way in which the defendant's theory is unsupported. That his arguments that Harmony died from something other than his hands the morning of December 7th, that is unreasonable. It was he who punished her with his fists that day, and it was he who decided to destroy, alter, conceal, and remove her body from the Sebring to be sure it couldn't be used against him when somebody came asking, where is Harmony? You may, when you're back in deliberations, be looking at the evidence in this case, different pieces of evidence that are there, photographs, diagrams, having a good understanding of where everything was, where it was found. And you may be asking yourself, why don't we have more forensic evidence here? First of all, the defendant is telling you that he falsified physical evidence. The other thing is that, as experts have told you time and time again, each one of the experts that got up here, time and elements can wear down DNA and fingerprints and blood. They were able to find DNA 100 sextillion times, more likely, from a female child of the defendant and Crystal Sori on this toothbrush in the very back of the trunk. 
the trunk of the Audi that the defendant abandoned, excuse me, of the Sebring that the defendant had abandoned. But by being so good in hiding his crimes and in intimidating the one witness, the eyewitness to him beating Harmony to death, by wiping down and hiding and destroying evidence, he was sure that there was going to be less and less of it around. And yet still, from that toothbrush, from the ceiling, the truth prevailed. Sometimes evidence is not always where you expect to find it. We heard testimony about this cooler, Christina Lubin's cooler, this cooler, that the defendant kept Harmony's body in. We know that Harmony was in there in a bag. We also know from Christina Lubin that she used to put money in there, and she had put money in there recently for the defendant to be able to take to help provide for the family. So we know there should be fingerprints on the inside of that because their fingers definitely would have gone in to take the money. And yet the fingerprints are not there. We know that latent prints sometimes go away. And yet when Kayla Montgomery comes forward and tells you, here is what I know. She finally comes forward in June. She leads everybody. She leads police to the evidence that actually corroborates and in ways that she never could have known. She never would have known what was in the fit seal. She never would have known that police would have been able to find a sample, an example from CMC of the bag that the defendant had stuffed Harmony into. She told you she initially thought with police this was the bag. She never would have known afterwards that Emily Thompson and Cameron Gibney both saw bag in the Portland Pie Cooler. She never would have known about what had happened and was found and was discussed in ch uh, testimony about the Union Street bathroom, the ATM records, the Home Depot receipt, the Econostay Lodge, the rental records. She never would have known that when she came forward with this. in the ceiling, not even my height. Kayla Montgomery is not climbing up there to be able to look and see that there's something still in that ceiling. Part of all of those different things and what happened, you should also go ahead and consider what Kayla said afterwards about the forensic evidence that she could not have known would have corroborated her. You heard about the bag of lime. It's not the fanciest looking bag of lime up there, is it? But that's the one that she identified. So let's talk about that for a moment. It's the bag of lime that has the same skew that had been purchased the day of February 26th. That at 1120 ATM withdrawal happened at the Citizens Bank, South Willow Street, and 20 minutes later, 20 minutes later, across the street at the Home Depot, that's when there's a purchase of that bag of lime. That SKU number specifically was found, as was testified to by the gentleman from Home Depot. A purchase of lime by a person who doesn't own a lawn and has nothing to fertilize in the middle of the winter. The common sense tells us maybe the defendant really wanted to get some lye, L-Y-E, like you would find in Drano, breaks down organic material, rather than lime to make your soil, uh, doesn't lower the pH, it raises it, makes it less acidic. But the lime purchased at Home Depot 20 minutes after the ATM transaction, and what was it purchased with? A grinder, a blade, That purchase, and a battery, excuse me. That's not a coincidence. Again, that's corroboration. Corroboration that when the defendant talked about how he wanted to get rid of Harmony's body, when they got their tax account, uh, refunds in their account, that's what he did. So when she told you, and we talked about, we heard about this a moment ago in cross-examination, when she told you that she had seen this grinder, new in a box at some point, believing that she had seen it at her mother's house earlier on when the defendant said that was the kind of saw he wanted to use to get rid of Harmony's body. 
And then when you heard that Christina Lubin doesn't own this kind of saw, it's a grinder. She does woodworking. This is not a woodworking tool. It's for grinding metal. You have to ask yourself, where is it then that Kayla saw this grinder in you in a box? Where was it? Again, not the lie of a master schemer, is it? Why would she concoct that out of thin air, as the defendant's arguing? Why say that that's the graw, signer, excuse me, saw, grinder or saw that he discussed when she knows and testified to you already that there's a corded saw in a box underneath the sink? If this was untrue, if she had not seen this grinder at some point, new and in a box, if she was singing for her supper, she would have instantly just said, oh, yeah, it's the saw that we have down there. Saw the whole thing. That's what happened. Yeah, detectives, that's the saw. But she didn't do that. She identified the grinder. She said she saw it new. She remembers it because that's what the defendant talked about wanting to use on Harmony. If she didn't see it at Christina Lubin's house, and the only other place you can reasonably conclude is that she saw it at Union Street, along with the bag of lime, and she doesn't remember it clearly. That's the only other reasonable, logical conclusion to make. It's not a coincidence that from their account the money gets taken out and 20 minutes later this happens. It's corroboration. And the next day, the next day, Dennis Cloutier is over at the house. The next day, trying to snake the drain as asked by the defendant. And who did he say is pacing behind him while he is trying to snake the drain? The drain and the drain cover that's already been off. Is it, no, no, it's not Caleb. It's the defendant, he said. <coughs> Just the defendant who is pacing behind him. More evidence that Kayla would never have known corroborates what happened. More and more and more. She could never have known that there would be easy pass toll records of the same rental vehicle going back and forth, as Trooper Hernandez told us, through the Tobin Bridge on the night that he left to get rid of the body with the U-Haul, she could never have known when she told police what happened, that those records were there, and that lo and behold, the odometer perfectly matches up for the distance to take that drive. Common sense tells you that. She didn't know that. She didn't know that that corroboration existed. Because it's not reasonable to think that Kayla would tell and enable police to find other evidence that she did something. You, she, if she was the one that who had killed Harmony, like the defendant wants you to believe, she would never have done any of this. The theory does not fit. And I want to jump to another reason why this theory does not fit. He's shown us that he's not the type of person that would have allowed this to happen under his theory. He's argued to you that he's a caring parent, despite what we've seen from the rest of the evidence. But his theory is, in fact, this, that they had planned for hours what to do with the body, and that the plan was to carry her around for months and store her in different places and then finally do something eventually whenever we get enough money for a grinder. That doesn't make sense. His theory is also that he was such a caring parent that he came home in the middle of the night from taking care of business to discover that his five-year-old that he fought to get custody of is dead while left in Kayla's care. And he just takes it. He doesn't react. He doesn't rage. His theory is that he doesn't hit Kayla or yell or scream so others can hear, is that he just sits in the car for the rest of the day and night and takes it goes to the methadone clinic at 704 like it's nothing in the morning and takes it. That's his theory. That's not him. That's not who we've seen. That he would show indifference towards Harmony's death. That he bags, carts, stores, stuffs, frees, thaws, squishes, consolidates his child. He does all of that, then leaves Kayla for another woman, leaves her with this woman that he's arguing to now, killed one of his children, leaves the other kids with her, and then takes off to Maine 
goes on to live his life. That's not him. That's not him. That's not what we've heard. He doesn't do nothing. He would not have been the passenger in this situation. He's the driver. What the defendant suggests his reaction was would not have been his reaction if Harmony just died in the middle of the night from something and he came back to find her in a duffel bag in the trunk. So we know that theory that depends on you believing that he's type of, that type of person does not work. It is a fantasy. It is beyond belief. It is a bizarro world that the defendant would have you believe in the light of discovering that his offspring is dead, that he does nothing, and that it's Kayla who's always doing the something. That's not reasonable because it's not supported by the evidence, not with the defendant's lies to others, not with the actions that we've seen him take towards Kayla, not with the evidence that he left on Kayla's face and arms and back. And he lied to others too. He lied to others too. Who's the one that's getting rid of the phone? He's got his new girlfriend, Kelsey Small, to get rid of the phone. You saw from the other video there, he doesn't put himself in front of the camera. In fact, you probably saw when he first walked in that he had half a hand over his face. The video's there, you can look at it if you'd like when we go back into deliberations. He lied to the tow truck driver about his address. He had to abandon the car, it was the crime scene. He used his, he told the tow truck driver, mm, I live at 77 Guilford Street. We know he doesn't live at 77 Guilford Street. He told the tow truck driver, I got no phone. We know he has a phone. He used it that night to Facebook message Matt Gendron to try to get a jump for the dead car. He lies to get rid of things. He tries to continue to hide. He tells Travis Beach, don't send me this stuff on Facebook. He certainly does have a cell phone during that time. He wants to get his car away from him as fast as possible. What better way to abandon it? Just tell the tow truck driver you don't have the phone and don't worry about it. Let him get rid of the evidence because he's telling you now that he's guilty of getting rid of evidence. to what he had to, which to you or I would be unspeakable acts to do to any human being, let alone a small child, let alone your own flesh and blood. He says in his arguments, you should find him guilty of altering, destroying, concealing, and removing Harmony's body. And he admits this, why? Because he thinks you're gonna be fooled his counsel questioned Kayla with the legal principle, and I'm sure you remember it. He was asking Kayla about her petty theft from Dunkin' Donuts. Well, you took some responsibility of it. Um, you took the lesser way out of the problem, so you wouldn't get a more serious charge. That's what he thinks that you're going to let him do. He thinks if you'll let him slide on the murder, if he admits to what happened afterwards because he knows the evidence of that is overwhelming, that you'll let it go on the other two. And he admits what he can't deny. He denies what he can't afford to admit. And the only part of harmony that we have left will be sitting in that deliberation room with you on that pink toothbrush and outside here in this part of the ceiling wall that's there. And the other parts of her body, her rest of her torso, her face, her eyes, that smile, only the defendant as we all sit and stand here today knows where they are. And he can't afford to admit to you that he knows where they are because the evidence contained on them will show that he caused her death. So she won't get the burial that everyone deserves. She doesn't get a headstone in the ground above the head that he battered. She doesn't get to be at peace in death because of what he did, because he can't afford to tell anyone where she is. She doesn't get dignity. She doesn't get peace because this man did nothing. He didn't, excuse me, didn't do nothing. He did something called murder. And because he says trying to find her is a waste of time. That trying to find her is a waste of taxpayer money. That's what he thinks of her. That's what he thinks of what he did. That's what he thinks of you now. 
efforts to find where he put her and what he did to her and why he killed her, they're a waste of time to him. His words, you heard them, to find the child that he murdered and the evidence that he hid. He believes Harmony's life and death are a waste of time and that they weren't anything to him and that he dumped her like trash. This is what you've seen in the evidence. This is what you've heard the defendant say when you consider whether he has an extreme indifference to the value of Harmony's life when he killed her. He had no value for her life when he killed her. He took an innocent life, a child for no reason other than his rage and his indifference and his ignorance and his lack of humanity. Because this trial is about Harmony Montgomery. And you sat here and you were so attentive to every moment, every terrible fact. You watch the eyes and the voices of every witness and you know it's not about quantity, it's about quality how they testified, how they looked at you when they answered questions on cross and direct. That was not a waste of time. Only Harmony's killer would say that finding her is a waste of time. That's bearing witness is what you have done to the truth. And that's a front row seat on what this man perpetrated on Harmony and her body and the truth from being shown to you, who cowardly runs off to Maine to distance himself from the scene of his crimes, who runs with Demetrios, comes to the house and could see that bruise on her face. And even then, a week later, Demetrios still saw marks of her after the defender had bashed her all around the house. The man who complains about tracking down leads in Arizona as a waste of effort to prove something. Yes, that's what people do. That's what this community, this state, this nation, this society do. We go to find and protect life. Every one of us, whether you wear a badge or you don't, you seek to protect children, to put the next generation above your own. That's what a father does. That's not what the defendant wanted because he is not Harmony's father. He has forfeited that right to even claim that title or call himself her father. She was never a daughter to him, not in July, not in December, not in that phone call not from the moment of her death, continuing up through this very day when he knows where she is. He killed somebody he didn't see as a daughter. He never saw her as a blessing. He beat down something he saw as a nuisance, that he saw as an inconvenience. His behavior to the bathroom accidents shows you that in that moment when he killed her, she wasn't a person, she was an object, a thing. And he was mad at this thing that ruined his car. And he hit, and he hit, and he hit this thing to make it stop doing what he didn't want it to do, to teach it a lesson. Until he said to Kayla, I think I hurt her this time. I think I did something. And he might as well have said, I think I broke it. And that's what he did to her afterwards. Only proves that his actions don't believe that he murdered his daughter. He broke one of his things. And like any broken thing that somebody never really loved, they throw it away. And that's what he did. He may have genetically donated half of his DNA to her, but he was not her father. She was an object that he beat, stuffed, threw, and shelved in a walk-in cooler. Cameron Gibney told you she was down next to the mustard. She was an object made even tinier from her 35 pounds when she was alive by defrosting and consolidating her down that he took to a hotel and he drove through some tolls and he threw it away. 
and he knows where she is right now, but he believes it's a waste of time and taxpayer money to try to find her. So don't you ever think that this man murdered his own daughter. Rebecca Maines told you he hated Harmony because she reminded him of her mother. Defense counsel told you don't to go ahead and put a motion aside and look at the facts. Look at the facts. Look at the facts and call him a killer. Put a motion aside, look at the facts, and then you can call him a tyrant. And you can call him a rageful. Call him rageful. Those descriptions. Descriptions suggested to you, maybe, evil. But don't call him a father. It's time now for you to hear the court's final instructions, to then go back into that room and deliberate all the evidence that you've seen, and to hold the defendant responsible for everything he did in July of 2019, in December of 2019, and afterwards. You promised both parties in the court during jury selection that when proof had been shown beyond a reasonable doubt of all of the elements of the crimes that you could and would hold the defendant responsible. And now, not all doubt, but all reasonable doubt. And that proof has been shown. You promised us during jury selection that you did that, and you would do that, and you saw Kayla testify. From that alone, you've got sufficient evidence to convict him of every charge, but you don't have to take her word for it because we've just talked about and you've seen for two weeks all of the evidence that corroborates and gives you what you need to find him guilty on each and every single one of these charges. We saw in this Kayla courtroom that Kayla is not lying about who hit Harmony. And there is no doubt about how Harmony was hurt in July, who killed her in December, what was done to her body and who did it, who falsified physical evidence, and how the defendant kept Kayla quiet. He's guilty of second degree murder for recklessly causing Harmony's death with extreme indifference to the value of life because you've seen beyond even that standard, he had complete indifference to the value of her your life. Kayla did nothing. He did a lot of things. He did something, he said. It's called murder. It's called assault. And he's guilty of every single one of those charges in front of you. And so I ask you, to hold him responsible for that truth in what you've seen in the facts, what you've seen, what you've tested, and what you've heard has been proven. Find him accountable and find him guilty on every single one of these charges. And I thank you so much for your time today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to give you my final instructions. As I said to you earlier, you will have, uh, I'll send 12 sets of all the instructions, both the ones that I gave to you prior to opening statements and the ones I give to you now as a whole. You will have copies of, written copies of these instructions with you in the jury deliberation room, so please listen carefully. Please remember that in order to reach a verdict in this case, whether it is guilty or not guilty, your verdict must be unanimous. Prior inconsistent statements. In deciding whether to believe a witness, you may consider whether the witness made statements before trial which were not consistent with the witness's testimony at trial. Thus, if the witness made an inconsistent statement before trial, you may use that statement in deciding whether to believe that witness's trial testimony. Keep in mind that you may not use the statement made before trial as proof that the facts in this statement are true. The statement made before trial is only to be used by you in deciding whether to believe a witness. There are, however, two exceptions to this general rule that prior statements may only be used in assessing witness credibility. If the statement made before trial was made by the defendant 
or by a witness under oath, then you may use that prior statement as proof that the facts in the statement are true. I'm now going to discuss the definition of a crime and the crimes with which the defendant is charged. The definition of a crime. A crime is the breaking of a law for which the law provides punishment. All crimes have at least two parts, an act and a criminal state of mind. In deciding whether a person is guilty of a crime, you must determine both what the person's actions were and what his state of mind was. For a person to be guilty of a crime, he must have physically acted to do something that is criminal, and he must have had a particular state of mind. Unless a person both acted to do something that is criminal and had the required mental state, that person has not committed a crime. That means that if a person either did not physically act to do something criminal or did not have the required mental state, then he is not guilty of a crime. To understand how mental state works, consider this example. Suppose two automobile drivers hit a pedestrian who was crossing the street. Suppose one of the drivers hit the pedestrian deliberately, whereas the other one did so out of carelessness. The two drivers would be guilty of different crimes even though they both committed the same act because each had a different mental state. Proof of intent. To prove that the defendant has committed a crime, the state must first prove that the defendant did certain acts and second that the defendant acted with a certain intent. Whether the defendant acted with the particular in intent charged is a question of fact for you to decide. Keep in mind that there is often no direct evidence of intent because there is no way of examining the operation of a person's mind. You should consider all of the facts and circumstances in evidence in deciding whether or not the state has proven that the defendant acted with the intent as it is charged in the indictment. Multiple indictments, one defendant. Each of the indictments against the defendant constitutes a separate offense. You must consider each indictment separately and determine whether the state has proven the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that you may find the defendant guilty or not guilty on one of the indictments should not influence your verdict with respect to the other indictments. The charged offenses. Charge ID 1937947C. The defendant is charged with the crime of second degree assault. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant caused bodily injury to Harmony Montgomery, and two, Harmony Montgomery was a child under the age of 13, and three, the defendant acted knowingly. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. Knowingly. A person acts knowingly when he is aware of the nature of his conduct or the circumstances under which he acted. The state does not have to prove that the defendant specifically intended or desired a particular result. What the state must prove is that the defendant was aware of the nature of his conduct. Charge ID 2027112C, the defendant is charged with the crime of second degree murder recklessly with extreme indifference to the value of human life. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant caused the death of Harmony Montgomery, and two, Harmony Montgomery was under the age of 13, and three, the defendant acted recklessly under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to the value of human life. These are the elements of the crime of sec second degree murder, recklessly with extreme indifference to the value of human life. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. Recklessly. A person acts recklessly when he is aware of and consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct would cause a certain result. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that considering the circumstances known to him, its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the conduct that a law-abiding person would observe in the situation. There are several components of a reckless mental state that the state must prove. 
One, the defendant was aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct would cause a particular result. And two, the defendant consciously disregarded the risk. In other words, he elected to disregard the risk and take the chance that his conduct would cause a particular result. It is not enough for the state to prove that the defendant failed to become aware of the risk involved. The state must prove that the defendant was aware of the risk and consciously disregarded it. And three, from what the defendant knew of the circumstances, his disregard of the risk was a gross deviation from what a law-abiding person would have done under the circumstances. The key words here are gross deviation. If you find that the defendant's actions were unreasonable or thoughtless, that is not enough. To find that the defendant acted recklessly, you must find that his disregard of the risk was a substantial departure from what a law-abiding person would have done under the same circumstances. For a killing to be second-degree murder, the defendant must not simply act recklessly, but rather must act recklessly under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to the value of human life. This means something more than merely being aware of and consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk of death. The risk involved and the disregard must be so blatant as to manifest extreme indifference to the value of human life. Charge ID 2027113C, falsifying physical evidence. The defendant is charged with the crime of falsifying physical evidence. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant believed that an official proceeding or investigation was pending or about to be instituted. And two, the defendant altered, destroyed, concealed, or removed the body of Harmony Montgomery. And three, the defendant's purpose in committing that act was to impair the verity or availability of the physical evidence in the proceeding or investigation. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. Official proceeding means any proceeding before a legislative, judicial, administrative, or other governmental body or official authorized by law to take evidence under oath or affirmation, including a notary or other person taking evidence in connection with any such proceeding. The term purposely. A person acts purposely when his conscious object is to engage in certain conduct. The state must prove that the defendant had the conscious object to engage in this conduct. The key words here are conscious object. To have a conscious object means to have a specific intent. It means that the defendant desired to engage in certain conduct. It is not enough for the state to prove that the defendant knew or was aware of what he was doing, nor is it enough for the state to prove that the defendant created a risk of injury or harm. To prove that the defendant acted purposely requires more than that. It requires proof that the defendant specifically intended or desired to do a particular act. Charge ID 2027114C, abuse of corpse. The defendant is charged with the crime of abuse of corpse. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove one, the defendant removed, concealed, or destroyed the corpse of Harmony Montgomery or any part thereof. Two, the defendant acted unlawfully. And three, the defendant acted knowingly. These are the elements of the crime of abuse of corpse. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. That word is knowingly. I've already read you the definition. Uh, I, in the instructions, I just refer you back to the definition that I gave you of knowingly. So it's the same definition that applies here. Charge ID 2027115C, tampering with witnesses and informants. The defendant is charged with the crime of tampering with witnesses and informants. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that the defendant believed that an official investigation was pending or was about to be instituted. 
and two, the defendant attempted to induce or otherwise cause Kayla Montgomery to testify or inform falsely. And three, the defendant acted purposely. The definition of purposely for purposes of this charge is the same as the definition of purposely that I have already read to you. I won't read it again, but you'll note that that definition is above. It is the same definition that applies to this charge. Those are the crimes that are pending against the defendant and are before you. The defendant's absence at trial. The, de the defendant has been absent from trial. His absence from trial is not evidence in the case. You are not to guess or speculate as to the reason for his absence, and you may not draw any negative or adverse inference as a result of his not being present. You are not to consider for any purpose or in any manner in arriving at your verdict the fact that the defendant was not present at trial. That fact should not enter into your deliberations or discussions in any manner at any time. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, let me say that this case is important to both of the parties, the state and the defendant. The principles of law that I have given to you are intended to guide you in reaching a fair result. You are to exercise your judgment and common sense with honesty, understanding, and due deliberation. As I said before, you should decide this case without passion, without prejudice, and without sympathy. It is your highest duty as officers of this court to conscientiously determine a fair and just result in this case. Now again, as you were instructed during the general selection process, there is a presumption of innocence that applies and continues throughout the trial until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of each and every element of the offenses with which he has been charged and the defendant has no obligation whatsoever to prove his innocence in this matter, and that includes the right not to testify if he so chooses. When you have considered and weighed all of the evidence, you must make one of the following findings with respect to the charges before you. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proved any one or more of the elements of the offense charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. On the other hand, if you find that the state has proved all of the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find the defendant guilty. And I remind you that a reasonable doubt is just what the words would ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based upon reason. It is not a frivolous or fanciful doubt, nor is it one that can easily be explained away. Rather, it is a doubt based upon reason as remains after consideration of all of the evidence that the state has offered against it. As I mentioned, we will select a foreperson at random at the end of these instructions. The foreperson acts much like the chair of a committee. He or she should make sure that you take up the issues that I have described and should make sure that each juror has a full opportunity to present his or her opinions and arguments. I suggest that deliberations involve several components. You should each think for yourself about the evidence and the law. You should speak up and let your fellow jurors know your opinions, views, and positions. You should listen carefully and keep an open mind as to what your fellow jurors have to say and you should make every reasonable effort to reach a unanimous agreement. The verdict that you reach must be a unanimous verdict and represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, all 12 of you must agree on your verdict. As you deliberate, try your best to work out your differences. Do not hesitate to change your mind if you are convinced that the other jurors are right and that your original position was wrong. But do not change your mind just because other jurors see things differently or just to get the case over with. In the end, your vote must be exactly that, your own vote. It is important for you to reach unanimous agreement, but only if you can do so honestly and in good conscience. If any questions concerning the law should arise during your deliberations, the foreperson should write the question out and sign and hand it to the court officer. The court officer will bring that to me and I will respond. You should take as much time as you like. 
you will be given a verdict form to complete. When you have arrived at a verdict, let the court officer know and you will be returned to the courtroom where the foreperson will render the verdict orally in response to questions that the clerk of court will ask. The jury foreperson may use the jury verdict form in answering the clerk's questions as to each charge. So ladies and gentlemen, I am going to send back one jury verdict form that has each of the charges and a place where you can record uh, what your verdict is. and. That document can stay with the jury foreperson when you are brought back into the courtroom uh, and our, the jury foreperson will use that to respond to the clerk's questions. Please bear in mind in your deliberations there can be no communications with anyone other than the other deliberating jurors in the case or the bailiff. You are not to use your cell phones or smartphones to communicate with anyone, check email or use the internet. Your verdict in this case must be based solely on the evidence presented at trial and the law as I have explained it to you. We will now select the alternates and the jury foreperson. So the first alternate will be juror number nine. So juror number nine will be our first alternate. Second alternate, juror number four. The third alternate, juror number five. Fourth alternate, juror number one. And finally, Fifth alternate will be juror number 15. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to pick the jury four person. Juror number two. Are you willing to serve as the four person? Yes? Okay, very good. Um, all right, um, let me just say the alternates, those of you who are selected as alternates will be taken to a separate location. You are not to discuss the case. You are not to read anything about the case. You are not to uh, look at any media, do any research. All the same rules that uh, applied before still apply to you now. There are times when we do need to use uh, one or more alternates for purposes of deliberations, so it is critically important that you're not discussing the case with each other or with anybody else. Uh, you're not to do any independent research. Um, don't look anybody up. You uh, are under sort of the same obligations as you were before. Um, in the event that we need to use you uh, for purposes of deliberations, we need to make sure that you haven't discussed the case with anybody or done any independent research. Uh, let me say for the, for the deliberating jurors, we're going to send you back into the deliberation room. You may begin your deliberations whenever you are ready. Uh, the exhibits, I explained to you before that the exhibits will go back into the deliberation room. Um, so all of the exhibits, with the exception of just a few, we are not going to send back. Um, a second. We are not going to send back. There was one body-worn camera video. If you wish to see the bo that body-worn camera video, what we would do is um, let the court officer know. We would bring you back in, and we could show it to you at that time. Uh, we're also not going to send back some of the larger, the sheetrock. Uh, the rails and the cooler, okay? But if you are interested in seeing any of those exhibits, please just let the court officer know and we'll bring you back into the courtroom and you'll be able to view those exhibits if you wish to do so. So the sheetrock, the rails, the cooler are not going to go back into the deliberation room. Uh, the Barty worn camera that you, that you viewed while you were here, that's also not going to go back. But if you wish to view any of those things, uh, please just let the court officer know. We'll bring you back in and we'll do it at that time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think uh, we have accomplished everything out here that we need to accomplish. You've been very, very attentive. I, uh, I very much appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna, now going to let the court officers take the, the alternates to their location and the jury uh, to the deliberation, the deliberating jurors to the deliberation room. All rise for the jurors, please.
You may be seated.